Good afternoon and welcome to the council. I'm your host Charlie Pacello and boy do we have a fantastic show for you today. I uh, just want to thank uh, KUHS Denver.com, KUHS The Stream, where we are broadcasting the Council Live here in Broomfield, Colorado. And we're broadcasting not only here all across Denver and all across the great state of Colorado, but all across our nation and around the world. We are reaching people all over this beautiful world all over the continents, six different continents, people are tuning in. Thank you so much for tuning in to the council every week. Uh, it is an honor and a privilege to be your host. The council is, uh, is doing a special uh, Veteran Summit series uh, currently. We are in collaboration with the Trauma Sensitive Awareness Foundation. And we are doing the part one, this is part one of the Veteran Summit series. It's a special 10 part interview a series dedicated to providing veterans and their loved ones with information, hope, inspiration, and healing. It's the first of its kind summit, and we're going to be exploring cutting edge treatments, alternative therapies for PTS, TBI, moral injury, sleep disturbance, family conflict, emotional trauma, and so much more. We're talking to mental health experts, veterans and their advocates to provide answers, resources, and solutions to bring all of our warriors home. We're starting the dialogue, and we've been starting the dialogue, and come on and join the conversation. Learn more about part two debuting in November. We're doing this every Friday at 1 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, all the way through September 25th, right here on www.kuhsdenver.com. Um, <clears throat> for many years, I have been working with uh, my guest here for uh, to help bring our our veterans home, our warriors back through uh, through Soldiers Heart. Uh, he was the director emeritus of Soldiers Heart, uh, and it was uh, Dr. Tick who was absolutely instrumental in helping me to understand the depth, the complexity, the uh, profundity of my own. Uh, war wounding, uh, working on the nuclear warfare program. For, for many years, well, over a decade, I was having a very difficult time trying to reconcile the activities that I had done and what I had participated in and being able to uh, reconcile that with my own soul. I was at war with my own soul. And it took me a long time to recover and it was a long journey. And it was a long journey down in the underworld in hell. And it was because of uh, Dr. Tick and his wife, uh, Kate Daldstedt, who helped me to get the keys to grab those jewels that were absolutely critical and necessary for me to be able to say, oh my gosh, this is what is going on within me. This makes sense. Now I understand. I'm not crazy. This is, this is what is going on within me. And that's why it is so important and I'm so honored to be able to share and talk to Dr. Tick today and, and share his wisdom with all of you because it helped me so much in recovering and becoming uh, the person I am today. Dr. Tick is, uh, Dr. Edward Tick is a nonfiction writer and poet. He's a transformational healer, holistic psychotherapist, educator, consultant, and international journey guide. Dr. Tick has been working to heal the invisible wounds of war and violent trauma for over 40 years. He is honored for his groundbreaking work in the spiritual, holistic, and community-based healing of veterans and other survivors of severe violence who suffer post-traumatic stress disorder and moral injury. He has published breakthrough books in this field, including the award-winning War and the Soul. His work introduce the ancient concept of soul wounding and how to heal it to our modern military, veterans, and trauma studies worlds. Dr. Tick is an internationally recognized educator, author, and expert on the military, veterans, PTSD, Vietnam, and the psychology, spirituality, and history of global trauma, warrior traditions, and military-related issues. For four decades, he has conducted trainings, retreats, and workshops 
across the country and overseas. He has trained staff, taught and worked with wounded warriors at major Department of Defense and Veteran Administration facilities and colleges, universities, hospitals, healthcare, and community centers across the country and overseas. Uh, his pioneering work has, uh, has served the U.S. military subject matter as an expert trainer for the Defense Department and at VA facilities. Uh, he's been doing that for the past decade. He is the co-founder of the nonprofit Soldiers Heart, Inc. with his wife and partner, Kate Dalstead, and for 13 years served as its director from their national offices in Troy, New York. He now consults internationally on these issues. This is my favorite of his book. It's Warrior's Return. It is actually about restoring the soul after war. It is, it is the journey of the warrior's coming return, which is the hardest part of the journey. And I can't encourage more of, of you who are tuning in and listening from around the world to grab this book and to read it. His website is www.edwardtick.com. That's E-D-W-A-R-D-T-I-C-K dot com. Welcome to the council again, Dr. Tick. Thank you very much, Charlie. I'm honored to be back with you and on the council and talking to all of our friends and colleagues out there around the world who are as concerned about these issues as we are. Oh, and we are, and it is, uh, it is something that uh, both you and I have uh, dedicated our lives to help alleviate, to reduce, to, to uh, educate people about what is truly going on, the truth that is actually happening inside uh, on those spiritual, moral, and ethical dimensions that are so critical for our, our, our well-being. And we often miss that along the way. And our topic today, uh, Ed, is, uh, is about the death and rebirth of the spiritual warrior. Um, I think probably people want to understand what we mean by this. So what, what do we mean by this? Mm -hmm. And why is this concept <clears throat> important to veterans and their loved ones to understand? I'm going to begin answering that question in two ways. Uh, rather indirect ways, but quite illustrative, and then we can be more didactic. Uh, and the first way to, that we understand the spiritual warrior is by looking at the transformation that some of our warriors are able to go through from their traumatic woundedness to really coming home and transforming into honorable men and women of strength, wisdom, service, compassion. And so my first comment on spiritual warrior and first teaching about it is that I'm telling the world Today is your birthday, <laughs> and you have become a spiritual warrior. I know you, you courageously and openly share some of your story with the public. Uh, you carry it with dignity, honor, and pride, not with shame. You're not hiding. You're not hiding your veteran status. You're not hiding the wounds that you struggled with. So when we talk about the death and rebirth of the spiritual warrior, we can talk, we're talking about you. You went into service to serve our nation, but utterly believing in our values and ideals. You experienced them utterly betrayed, and that caused an internal, a deep internal wounding to your soul, to your moral system. You went through your collapse, you fell into the underworld, and you have done extraordinary depths of healing, learning, uh, giving service, digging into these wounds to understand their real source in our souls and our spirits and our culture, uh, transcending the diagnostic nonsense that the mental health system and the VA system imposes on our warriors, which is external to warriorhood and doesn't understand the transformation. And you've emerged as one of our leading spiritual warriors of your generation. So death and rebirth of the spiritual warrior is you. And the model of descending and returning that you have lived and given to all of us. So bless you. Happy birthday, spiritual warrior. We love you and we need you. Thank you. I didn't expect that. 
Uh, some ambushes, <laughs> some <laughs> ambushes are good, buddy. Yeah, that's a good Some ambush. ambushes are good. <laughs> That was a good one. Uh, that was yeah. thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, um, and uh, while you breathe it in, uh, I'll continue for a moment uh, with another example of the transformation. What is the death of the spiritual warrior and what does the rebirth look like? Uh, you and I and people in our camp believe in and work with the archetypes. Archetypes are the foundations of our being. They're built into the unconscious, they're built into the universe, they're built into all of our personalities, and warrior is one of our foundational archetypes. Since the archetypes are in the core of our psyches, and psyche means soul, not mind, uh, working with the archetypes is inherently moral and spiritual. And what happens to the archetype by how it's trained, how it's developed, how it's asked to serve, and especially then how it's manifested in the world through military service, either enlarges it or wounds it, either continues a spiritual development or betrays the archetype and instead develops what we call the shadow warrior, the dark side. Um, I, uh, Star Wars, mm -hmm. being possessed by the dark force. Um, and so when we're in living with the warrior archetype, that can happen easily because it is so possessive and intense, and also because of how the, uh, the, the domineering culture uses or misuses it. Mm -hmm. So we'll be talking about that this entire time. The, arch the warrior archetype is sacred and is meant to be treated as sacred mm -hmm. throughout the life cycle how we use it in a secular and violent and abusive way for other than are there any other ends than pure and true self-defense for the preservation and protection of our lives anything else betrays the warrior archetype so um, i'm going to tell a brief story from uh, our working with our vietnam veterans as you mentioned um, our work has been in significant part, uh, healing and bringing home our Vietnam veterans and helping them reconcile with Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, since 2000, we've been uh, uh, we've been leading healing and reconciliation journeys over to Vietnam and uh, working on these moral and spiritual and cross-cultural dimensions and bringing restitution and reconciliation between our peoples, our countries. I'd like to share a, a, a brief story and a short poem that demonstrates the death and the rebirth of the spiritual warrior. Absolutely, absolutely. One, one of our Vietnam veterans who went back to Vietnam with me, his name was Al, and uh, he had been in a brutal, brutal, brutal firefight on his 19th birthday. Um, is he was on, in a, on a small fire base in the boonies and the unit were, uh, uh, experienced a suicide attack by an entire company, not a company, a regiment um, of uh, uh, Vietnamese uh, foes. Uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of people coming at their fire base and the whole day was a monster slaughter. Many of the Americans were killed or wounded and 300 Vietnamese soldiers attacking them were killed. Mm -hmm. Al and his surviving companion, uh, and he, that was his birthday. Wow. Speaking of birthdays, <laughs> wow. that's a, yeah. That's a different kind of birthday. What a way, what a way <laughs> to, to enter your 20s, huh? Oh boy, yes. So uh, he survived, yeah, he survived and he and his comrades <laughs> spent the rest of their, well, several days digging a mass grave for all of the fallen Vietnamese. He felt that was such a deep moral injury, such a profanity to the dead. Instead of honoring the, all of the fallen warriors, they really they profaned the bodies and the, the memories and the spirits of the fallen Vietnamese. Wow. So he felt guilty about this his whole life. Yeah. Well, we went back to Vietnam and we located a place in the jungle where that fire base had been. 
he wanted to return there to tell the local Vietnamese where the mass grave was and return those souls mm -hmm. to their families and their village. Mm -hmm. We did. And he was beloved by the Vietnamese people. He thought they would hate him and treat him as a mass murderer. They hugged him, they thanked him, they prayed to him and for him, they put their babies in his hand. Uh, and um, the site was right next to uh, a lake, and so after this, after identifying the place, returning to the Vietnamese, being blessed by them, he went wading into the lake to pray to the souls. Mm -hmm. And he went in up to his chest, and that was a, a purification and baptism for him. When he came out, his wallet was gone. <laughs> he had the lake had taken it right. and he came out and he wasn't upset he said my old identity is washed away ah. I'm no longer that person the Vietnamese have accepted me and they honor me and love me and I don't understand that but I'll accept it and I'm a new man yeah. so I've got a new identity I'm letting it all go so the death and rebirth of the spiritual warrior his time in the firefight in, in country was the death of the spiritual warrior and his return and our time on the lake and with the Vietnamese was its rebirth. Mm -hmm. And I have a brief poem called Praying mm -hmm. about this experience. So the first stanza is the death, the second is the rebirth. Praying. And we dedicate it to Al who experienced this and to all of our veterans going through this difficult death rebirth process. Mm -hmm. Praying. Never in my life did I pray so hard as that day at the bottom, at the smoking bottom of this mountain among giant boulders and fallen trees when the enemy overran our wire and sprouted like berserk rice stalks you no know, farther away than the length of my rifle, and our muzzle holes became God's wrathful eyes. Never in my life did I pray so hard. Until today, on the cloud-crowned top of this mountain, among, among smiling statues and wafting incense in the, their pagodas, when their children took my hands and called me uncle. The monks bowed to me as if I were a saint, and I embraced their dead as my true brothers, and God's loving eyes gazed through my torn and mending heart. Wow. wow. Oh, boy. Um, it's, uh, when you hear those words, they open up to you to the depth of, um, our souls and the anguish that we feel, and then the purification that comes through when we're finally able to extinguish or to, to let go of all that's been, been plucking us up and plugging us up and keeping us con you know, contaminated. We've been contaminated by the, the wars. We've been contaminated by the experiences. We were wounded by it. And, um, and you know, before I understood the, the significance of this death and rebirth motif, before I understood that, I was kind of walking aimlessly around trying to uh, deal with my guilt to deal with my shame, to try to to say that I, you know, this is what I contributed to. These are the people that I hurt. I can never forgive myself for it. I can never do that. And and that is a, a universal theme that veterans carry, that they feel about some of the things that they've done. I mean, and it's part and parcel of the warrior experience because once you go into becoming and you hear the call to being a warrior, 
you're going to be changed. You are going to be altered by that experience. It's inevitable. It is going to happen. You are going to, the person you go into it with, you're not going to be the same person when you come out. And part of that process is going to be the sloughing off, the dying off of the old self. And war is that place, that arena that we get caught up in that is the crucible that is our testing grounds. Whether it's on the fields of Vietnam, whether it's in Iraq and Afghanistan, wherever it may, or Korea or World War II, that is our testing grounds. And it is, um, people can lose their souls along the way. And Ed, I would love for you to be able to talk a little bit more about why is war a, um, a spiritual arena? Why is it something that, um, you know, why is it more of a spiritual arena, moral arena? You know, because mm -hmm. I think if we talk about it, help people to understand that un more, they'll be able to gain as we go back to the idea and this uh, concept of the death and rebirth of the spiritual warrior. If we can give them some context about um, why war is, is, is a spiritual and moral arena. Our religious, spiritual, and mythological traditions all teach us that war is a spiritual arena. In our Judeo-Christian tradition, God was the one who gave us war to work out our challenges and conflicts down here, and the ancient people taught that uh, we do go to war under the protection of our God or gods, and we are blessed or cursed, victorious or defeated, based on what the spirituality of the universe, the universe what the gods determine. In the Greek tradition, there were two God, uh, deities of war, Athena and Ares. One, Athena, was the protectress of civilization. She grieved war, and she only used it to preserve and protect civilization, and she didn't want to do it. Ares is the berserker. Ares was the god who delights in slaughter. Some of our veter our warriors and some warriors worldwide go into the military in order to, just because they want to have the experience of war. Uh, one of the veterans we were with yesterday during our Agent Orange uh, seminar said, I knew the world was crazy, so I wanted to go to war to experience its deepest insanity. Mm -hmm. Another veteran I was working with earlier this week said, I wanted to be a writer. I didn't believe in the war I was sent to, but I wanted to have the most extreme human experience because war makes people into writers. I had to have that experience so I could write about it. So there are many reasons for going that are not political or sociological or economic, though the way our culture makes war is for those reasons, political, social, economic, and not at all in the United States any longer for real protection of the homeland. Mm -hmm. All right, so war is the, the essential values of the warrior are preservation and protection. Yes. They are not, we are not meant to be turned into people who wantonly destroy and kill. Mm -hmm. When, and life is holy, life is sacred. Whenever we harm or take life, we are causing moral injury to ourselves and the other. Mm -hmm. Some cultures know and recognize this and prepare their warriors for the terrible moral injury of taking life. Uh, it's another thing we neglect. We keep our military secular. We have our chaplain corps, but they are, they're beautiful people, but they're relatively disempowered in our military. Uh, and we don't give our warriors, as part of their training, lessons in spiritual warrior and moral behavior under extreme life-threatening conditions. Mm -hmm. And we don't recognize and award it in the military when our warriors save lives, mm -hmm. when they stop atrocities. I've worked with many warriors who have 
who have intervened in and stopped atrocities and they felt ashamed of it because they said, none of my comrades were doing this. I actually risked my life to stop them from killing or raping a civilian. Mm -hmm. And nobody talked about it or recognized me or rewarded me for moral behavior afterwards. Mm -hmm. So we don't even recognize moral behavior um, downrange in the combat zone. And there isn't enough support for it. So the bottom line is that life is holy. Mm -hmm. Destroying life is an unholy act. Mm -hmm. Warriors have to do it. Yes. We better help them and support them in doing it absolutely under only the absolutely most necessary conditions after everything else has failed. And we need to teach everyone that they will be different, as you said, they'll be different forever. And you, young man or young woman, you're not going to be the same person when you come home. Mm -hmm. And your family needs to know this too. Don't expect the same son or daughter or husband or, and wife to come home. Everybody's going to go through life-altering changes. Yeah. And everybody's going to experience a death, psycho-spiritual death, mm -hmm even if they are untouched physically and need to go through the rebirth process. Now, we talk, last comment for now, we, you and I and our colleagues talk, teach about the initiation process. We are, we become a different person and we need to be seen and honored and initiated as the new person we are. Mm -hmm. Initiation is quite simply the death and dismemberment of the old self and the rebirth and rememberment, recreation of a new self. Mm -hmm. uh, we've only put our military people through the, ha the first half of the process. We take apart the civilian identity, dismember, deconstruct it. We send them overseas, give them their time in the underworld, in hell, in the war zone, mm -hmm. and then come home on your own. Good luck. <laughs> or you're mentally ill or criminal. <laughs> Right. So, so we right. don't nurture the rebirth and the reintegration process. So homecoming has to fundamentally be a psycho-spiritual rebirth. Mm -hmm. Not just training people for jobs and how to keep their budget and how to pay their bills. Right. That won't hold if the soul is shattered. No. But if the soul is reborn out of the conflagration, all the other pieces will come together. Well, and I and what you're saying is is spot on. I had such a difficult time after the shattering that I'd experienced in my, with my own soul, in being able to hold on to a job and uh, do a work that was uh, up to my, my my qualifications and experiences. I couldn't do that. I was. <laughs> Uh, not able to, to, to maintain a solid relationships. My relationships were, uh, I, I was uh, n numbing myself with uh, alcohol and drugs to try to start to feel good. That was my way of escaping because my soul was shattered. And I wasn't, and I wanted to go back to being the guy that I was before I went in and the young innocent man. Well, that wasn't, there was no way for me to go back to that. And at the same time, the people who wanted me, who longed for, who wished that I could go back to that person, that person was gone because I couldn't erase the, the, uh, the, the knowledge anymore of the things that I was contributing to my life force and my energy <clears throat> for the dishonorable uh, reasons that we were engaged. We were, we were nuclear annihilation. That's what I was engaged in. That was the work that I was doing, was to annihilate. And, that's not, and that goes against everything what the warrior is all about. That goes against everything at the core at the, of, of, of your own conscience and your own ability to know what is the right way, what is, uh, you know, a themis, the right way. If you betray that, uh, if you go anathema, you go against the way and you just know it. You know it in your core, in your soul when you do it. And, and, and it's, it, you can't come back from that. You can't go because it's shattered. And until you understand the process to be able to move through that, you'll stay stuck just like I stayed stuck for years. I stayed stuck for, for at least a decade, maybe more, 
uh, just cycling in <clears throat> this, the, the pain and not being able to address it and being haunted by the memories and being haunted by the nightmares and then medicating myself to feel better and then get, being guilty for those things and the things that I, I mean, it was just one on top of the other because I, I didn't have the tools and the understanding to address it and I couldn't go to seek the VA because I was not allowed to do go to the VA because I had gotten a, a dishonorable discharge, not a dishonorable, but an other than honorable conditions discharge. So I was left, I was falling into the wound. I was collapsing into the wound. Uh, and, and I didn't even think my own life was worth living anymore. So I, that's where I was at. And it wasn't until I really got and really got the importance of the understanding of the deeper significance of that psycho-spiritual process of that birth, death, and rebirth motif. It wasn't about me ending my life. It was about part of me had to die in order for this new person to be reborn that could carry all of this wounds and then become something bigger and, and better than I was and serve in a much larger capacity for the highest good for a cause that's greater than myself. But it took me a long time, but I had to get that. I had to get and understand the importance of that of that <clears throat> process, and in order for me to do it, and I think you mentioned a, a couple already, uh, at, at, about where we we get this motif, where we understand it. You know, we talk about how war was. In, you know, God gave us war, and it was a part of the the Greek pantheon with Athena and Ares, but it also the motif of the of the of the dying and being reborn. Is a, is a motif that shows up and it's supposed to guide us in these, these mythological heroic journeys to help us on our own journeys. And if we don't get that, we miss that and then we're stuck. Can you help us to understand a little bit more of the significance of this process, where it shows up in our culture, our stories, and, and how can people, uh, how does this show up in their individual lives? The death rebirth motif is universal in religious and spiritual and mythological uh, stories that we've all inherited. Even a very simple and beautiful one, of course, is Jesus' story. Yeah. And we could say that the crucifixion is PTSD and moral injury. True. You're nailed to your cross. The world is turned against you. Some people are grieving. Some people are stabbing. Nobody understands. And you're in anguish screaming for help and we could say that well the story doesn't end there mm -hmm. we could say that the rebirth of the warrior is like um, transcendence off the cross and into the spiritual realm mm -hmm. for the individual so this motif is in our culture and throughout our myth mythology and history mm -hmm. Our culture makes the most hideous mistake in the way the mainstream mainstream psychology and the VA system both respond to warriors for many reasons. But what we're concerned about is the death rebirth process. When we diagnose somebody as having PTSD and we throw medications at them and we tell them this is a chronic lifelong condition and it's broken brain and you can't heal and you're going to live with it forever and the best you can do is learn to manage your symptoms and that is has been a dominant treatment for decades when we enforce uh, impose that on warriors we are actually freezing them in their crucifixion we're freezing them in the world the, the traumatic wound what we need everyone to know what you learn through your devoted anguish is to keep traveling through the underworld. It's not the end point. PTSD is not the end. Mm -hmm. PTSD is what the wound looks like when it dominates the soul. Mm -hmm. But when we realize we can travel through it, we won't get our innocence back. It's a one-way journey. You're not going to be the person you were when you left. Mm -hmm. Your family isn't going to be the same. You're not going to get your innocence back. You're not going to understand life the same way ever. Mm -hmm. This is what we call warrior wisdom. You've been initiated 
and awakened to the most difficult and demanding dimensions of the human life story. And you need to keep traveling through that traumatic wound, through the underworld, to emerge on the other side and go through a rebirth. And for any of our brothers and sisters out there looking for counseling or therapy or coaching, we do. I highly recommend Charlie as a very wise coach for traveling this journey and healing from your traumatic wounding. We need coaches who have done the journey, who don't circumvent it, who don't freeze it in place just trying to control the symptoms so we're comfortable and functional and who really understand the warrior archetype and warrior spirituality and uh, and the warrior traditions of the world to call them into service on behalf of our contemporary warriors rebirth. Mm -hmm. So we keep them traveling and as we, you know, we know and we've developed together, uh, you and I and our colleagues have developed what we call the soldier's heart model, mm -hmm. which is a, a road map for the transformational journey home. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we can share that as we go along, but two points I want to make here is that most schools of psychology can't do this because they're imposing theory from the outside. Mm -hmm. We need to be phenomenological, which means really listen to and understand and affirm the experience of the veteran. Don't tell a veteran what it means or what happened in their, in their minds or their brains. Listen to their lived experience and immerse yourself in it with them and affirm the genuine living uh, and dynamic nature of that experience. And then the archetypal or transpersonal perspective or Jungian and Hilmanian if uh, you're studying those, but those schools of psycho humanistic psychology, those schools that include moral and spiritual dimensions that know and use poetry and mythology, but fundamentally that recognize the warrior archetype, that it has been wounded and it's in breakdown or lost or shattered in the wound we call PTSD, and they can lead it to restoration through the steps of the warrior's journey home. Mm -hmm. So, affirming the real experience, mm -hmm. talking with and, and really engaging the real experience, not turning away from it or running from it, mm -hmm. and a lot of therapists do that because they can't handle it, they haven't been initiated yet. Mm -hmm. Realizing that the therapy too is going to change everybody. Mm -hmm. Not only the veteran, the therapist, the counselor has to be willing to be exposed, to be hurt, to lose innocence, and to be transformed. I'm not a veteran, as you know. I wasn't in the military, but I'm a warrior, and I've been utterly awakened and transformed by my service with you yes. all these decades. Yeah. And I'm not afraid of this stuff anymore. And I've gone through my own dark night of the soul to be able to live with it and tolerate it without, um, without feeling the usual revulsion that most people feel when they're exposed to extreme violence. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to tolerate and integrate that, realize that's part of the human experience and also part of the divine experience, and keep traveling through the steps of warrior return to, to, to restore the warrior archetype. Yeah. The Lakota people called the wound that we call PTSD in their language is nahi mm -hmm. which means the spirits left, mm -hmm. the spirits left. Mm -hmm. So their medicine people knew what to do. The warrior spirit is lost. Mm -hmm. It's gone, it's wounded. He, he or she are empty. We need to restore spirit. Mm -hmm. We restore spirit and everything will come back. And then instead of the traumatic wound dominating the psyche, the psyche is the soul and it grows much bigger so it can carry the wound without collapse, mm -hmm. as you now do. <laughs> because of the uh, ex uh, of soldier's heart, because of the, the journey that you had laid out so brilliantly, you and Kate had laid out so brilliantly uh, to map out the, the passageway. I was 
innately starting to do that, but I just didn't know eh, when I was initially re-wounded in my experience and I was at the point in teetering between uh, <laughs> staying alive or, or suicide. I was at that edge, I was at the abyss, and um, it was everything I could possibly do to keep on going. And then, of course, I started working with uh, another doctor, and then I met you and Kate, and that gave me the tools that helped me to start moving through the journey and the seeing that this was already laid out, that what you're talking about, uh, what the Lakota people were saying, the spirit had left me. The spirit, my spirit had left me. I literally felt like when it happened, when, I, when, I, when that moment, it, it's a long story, but when that moment happened where I was in the, in the, in the trauma, I could literally feel like my soul was not in my body anymore. There was a hole. There was a big gaping hole right where my soul should have been. And it was the most yes. excruciating pain I'd ever felt in my entire life. It was never went away. It followed me everywhere. And it was nothing I can do. And the only thing that I wanted to do was to, I, the only thing I could think about was to end my life. But I kept going. And then I met and, and learned about Soldier's Heart. I met you and we started walking that and, and slowly, I mean, it was started to retrieve my soul again. It was all part of this soul retreat because this was the, the, the um, there was another uh, doctor who came on the show from the indigenous cultures and he said it was the, they called it the injury where blood doesn't flow. Oh. And, and that's what it is. Your soul needs to be retrieved. So let's talk about and share uh, Ed, the steps of the, the warrior's return, the tending of the wounds, the acceptance of their destiny, the, the, the purification and, and uh, storytelling and, and restitution, and, and all of the steps that are so important for those warriors and those families who are going to be listening to, the, who are listening to it right now and who will be listening to this in the very near future. Okay, beautiful. Uh, let us affirm the experience of soul loss, soul, sh soul shattering. Uh, modern psychology talks about dissociation. Uh, when the, the center of consciousness leaves the body uh, and we have, we're in flashback, we don't know what's happening, we're not recording the present moment, uh, we can understand what they call dissociation as one aspect of soul loss. Mm -hmm. We're not going to psychologize it, we're broadening it to include the spiritual dimensions. And I, as you just witnessed, I've wor worked with so many warriors who experienced soul loss and often knew exactly the moment it happened. Mm -hmm. um, oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. We, mean, can, we can even say, that's when it happened. That's when, happen. when my soul left my body. Mm -hmm. uh, so I won't tell those stories now because of our short time. But um, my book, War and Soul, opens up with one of those stories, um, a, a very, very vivid story mm -hmm. of immediate soul loss during the siege of Quezon in the Vietnam War. Uh, and, uh, and that warrior also, his name was Art, he knew it. He knew it the moment it happened. Mm -hmm. And then he labored for decades and we labored together to bring his soul back in. Mm -hmm. So this is real. Mm -hmm. The positive dimension of this, another Vietnam veteran I'll honor right here, his name was Ron, experienced his soul leaving. He was uh, the uh, was the driver and, and gunner and, and chief of uh, an armored personnel carrier. And during a really brutal firefight, he felt, he was in the, in the APC, he felt his soul go up into the palm tree over his head and watch the battle until it was over. Wow. Then it came back down. And he said, he said, at the, mo the moment it happened, it was horrific and terrifying. However, I now realize it was the most important spiritual experience of my life because it taught me I have soul. <laughs> it taught me souls are right, real. Right, souls and it taught me I better yeah. spend my life tending my soul yeah. beyond anything else. And so he did, and he's fine. Well, and that's what okay. the ancients taught, too, was that, I mean, if you go back to Socrates and Pythagoras and... Uh, some of the early prophets and Jesus, you know, they all talked about caring for the soul. The soul, you know, that was what was most important. Was what was your soul? Because that's what goes on. This is this this passes. Buddha, everything changes. Everything falls. You know, changes constant. You've got to connect, and because the soul is what moves forward, 
after we leave this life. And, and so anyway, I'm sorry, but I just yeah. I wanted to add that. No, that's right. That's the right. Ancients and just as, that. as a footnote, Socrates gave us the meaning of the soul that we've been inherited and been developing for 2,000 years. People don't know this. Socrates was a, was a very severely tried combat veteran. Yes. <laughs> three major battles in the Peloponnesian War, and he kept his soul intact, even on the battlefield. So he was the bravest and most courageous of the warriors. And it taught him about the soul and the importance of protecting it. So let's briefly uh, review our model for the return journey. And the first thing we need to say is, just as we have the, uh, the death and rebirth, the, de de uh, the deconstruction and the recreation of the soul, we're also all on the hero's journey, and it overlaps, as Joseph Campbell gave it to us. There's the departure from the ordinary, the, uh, the going down into the underworld, and then the return. And he said, and we experience, and our warriors know this, coming home is way more difficult than being in combat. We know what's going on over there, who we're supposed to be, what we're supposed to do, but coming home, I thought my society would help me come home. I thought they'd understand what I went through. I thought I'd be honored, but instead I'm drugged and neglected and judged and, and pathologized. Uh-uh, we don't do that. The Native American and the Greek and, other, and the biblical and other cultures had complex and beautiful uh, way for bringing their warriors home. What we've done in our soldier's art model is study them and abstract the principles, the key, the six creed, the six eight principles of warrior return and map it out and then create practices, exercises at our retreats where we take people through these steps. Mm -hmm. So briefly, the first step, do we have enough time for this? Yes, we do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the first step <laughs> that traditional cultures give their people and we don't is isolation and tending of the the warrior upon return. We rush people back on our supersonic transports and get them home sometimes 24, 36, 48 hours after the combat. They're still in combat. <laughs> yeah. They're still in combat and we send them home and the families are waiting there to hug them and everybody looks happy. Well, till you get home, until the war still goes on. And so we have massive drug and alcohol abuse and domestic violence and child abuse and sexual acting out of all kinds because they're still at war they haven't come home traditional cultures gave warriors time and space to rest to do nothing uh the, the plains people had a, a new warrior's teepee and the, the warriors coming home from their first battle would be put in there and they'd stay there for days and days and days only tended by the elder warriors and the medicine people, the healers. And they weren't even allowed to touch people or to touch their own food because they're full of war poison. Mm -hmm. That has to be taken out. So first step is isolation and tending. And lots of our warriors do that on their own. Mm -hmm. That's what I did. They rent the motel room. <clears throat> they sit on a porch. They stare at nothing. They get lost in the woods. I was locked in my They're apartment. They're trying to get... <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Hide in our apartment. I was hiding yeah. in my apartment. Yep. Right. So we, let's give them isolation and tend them so they don't have to isolate alone and feel like it's pathological. It's not. It's sane to deeply rest and do nothing else after what you've been through. The second step we call the affirmation of your warrior destiny. It, and again, in the Plains tradition, um, the elders would ask, did you not choose to be a warrior in your people's service? Mm -hmm. And only when the warrior could say a calm, deep, sincere yes, I choose to be a warrior, did they move on in the homecoming and come out of the teepee? If they scream, no, 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 I hated it, well, you stay in the teepee till you can accept it. Mm -hmm. Or if they said, yeah, let it be out, I want to kill some more. Oh boy, you're the really dangerous warrior. You're not coming out. They're the ones who want to be preservers. Mm -hmm. So when a warrior can say, yes, I choose to be a warrior, and I accept the many hardships of this journey through life, mm -hmm. then they're 
came out and then they were ready for the next steps. The third step, this is done differently in different cultures, but the step is universal. Purification and cleansing. The war has to be taken out of us. Uh, one Korean war nurse who was Native American was met by her tribe and her elders upon return from the U.S. They created a huge metal wheel on the ground as the plane landed. She knew her people were there for her. She wasn't going to be neglected. Mm -hmm. And then when she came out of the plane, the elders and the medicine people surrounded her and said, you can't come home. You're coming away with us for three months so we can take the war out of you. Wow. Now she's she's alive and well, and she's one of the spiritual leaders in, on her reservation uh, on the West Coast. So we have to take the war out. And the Bible declared it. Moses said all returning warriors have to go through a full week of isolation and purification outside their villages before they can come back in. He, Moses said too, take the war out first. Um, Native Americans use sweat lodge and vision quests and other ceremonies. There are worldwide ceremonies for this, including modern versions. So purification and cleansing is essential. After that comes storytelling. And in our culture, well, most vets don't tell their stories. And then when they're under immense inner pressure or pressure from the family, yeah, and then they go to the therapy and they tell their story to one person or to a group. But in general, the culture doesn't get the stories. Mm -hmm. That's insufficient. It's helpful, but insufficient because the stories need to be told to the entire culture, the entire community. The community has to witness the story and honor it and welcome the warrior home no matter what his or her story and no matter whether or not we agree with the war it's not about politics it's about what this warrior experienced in our name and our responsibility to witness it and carry it together and help them come home so after storytelling then comes what we call restitution and restitution is two ways. It's the community and it's the, the warrior. The community practices restitution by, as we do at our retreats and we've done together, saying, Charlie, I did what you did. You did it in my name, with my money, with my tax money, with my knowledge to protect me. And even though you didn't end up protecting me, I sent you when you were serving for me in my name. So I sent you. And everything you did is also my responsibility. That's what the citizenry needs to say. Transfer the responsibility from the dark deeds and experiences in the war zone from the warrior to all of us so we carry it together. Mm -hmm. And the flip side of restitution is the warrior. The warriors do need to atone. Yes. We carry big karmic debts. Yes. And we've helped take the world apart. We have to help put it back together. Mm -hmm. You're doing that right now. Show. And with the coaching and the healing work that you do for others. Mm -hmm. So many of our warriors want to serve other warriors mm -hmm. or become first responders mm -hmm. to keep giving back mm -hmm. and keep protecting. Mm -hmm. In some part, we've built, as you know and helped with, we've built two schools in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. We help Agent Orange victims there. Some of our veterans uh, have adopted Vietnamese uh, destitute people. Uh, Kate and I have a Vietnamese goddaughter. Um, so that's restitution, that's, that's practicing atonement by repairing the world where we harmed it. I wasn't in Vietnam, I didn't have to do it, but I did have to do it, because I carry the moral injury of the Vietnam War, even though from the beginning I was against that war and in favor of our warriors. Okay, well, it's my wound too. I've been in Vietnam, I've been a year and a half in country, hooray, <laughs> I've had my year in country. <laughs> Finally, the last step in the process, and traditional cultures only call their people warriors after they ex experience the entire homecoming. Mm -hmm. The final uh, step is initiation as a warrior, being recognized and honored by your culture as a warrior so that you can walk proudly as a warrior for life mm -hmm. and be seen and honored as an elder warrior carrying warrior wisdom that we need in the community for all of us to be healthy. Mm -hmm. And when somebody goes through all of those steps in any way they do, through our roadmap, at our retreats, on their own, 
joining the Native American communities or traveling to Africa and going through traditional communities, mm -hmm. doesn't matter which embodiments or forms of the steps you take, but it really does matter and it's absolutely necessary that you go through these steps. Yeah. And that's pushing through the PTSD to emerge and get off your cross and join us as a spiritual warrior who has returned and is going on to help serve and heal for the greater good for all of us. Well, and I, it's such a beautiful, <clears throat> beautiful stage. It's such a beautiful path and, and model that you uh, that you and, and Kate have developed, and, uh, and it has helped thousands and thousands of veterans, uh, including myself. And I also, you know, for me, I think it's important it, that it, it's not necessarily a linear process. It's very, for me, it was very cyclical. So yes, this was the steps that you had to take or that I took, but it was cyclical. Sometimes I'd be in storytelling and ready to tell, and then I'd have to go back to purification or maybe something that I wasn't ready to accept it, and so I was bouncing. But this journey was what got me to the point where, and I wanna share this with everyone, uh, right before doing this show, I had a dream. Uh, and I used to have uh, all kinds of different dreams to help rebuild, and, I, and there, it's a whole nother topic, but the dream was this. Um, I was walking into a, a boarding room, uh, and it was a 19th century boarding room, like around the uh, Civil War time. And I was looking, and I was getting ready to, to I, was, I was being asked to do another, some kind of service. And I was getting ready, and I looked into the mirror, and it wasn't my face. And I was trying to pull it off, and it was a, it was um, a, the image of a, of a Civil War soldier uh, with beard, and he was looking at me, and he was smiling. And then I looked over at another mirror, and it was a different face. And then I and, and same thing, smiling. And I looked over at another face, and I looked over at another. I must have looked at about that was on my face was about 40, 50 different veterans from the Civil War that were from the, on the Union side. And they were, at first I was scared. At first I was a panic, but at the but all of them smiled back. Now I'm getting goosebumps as I, I haven't shared this with anybody. It just happened. And I think that that's, um, I think that's when you know that um, you're on the right path and you're doing the right work and that you're bringing peace uh, mm -hmm. to people who have, uh, are, are your ancestors and that all of this stuff is interconnected. And um, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, that, that's so beautiful, and thank you for sharing it with me and with the world. Yeah. Um, and this is also storytelling, that we bring our most sacred uh, experiences to our community to be honored and affirmed. Mm -hmm. Traditional cultures teach that what you experienced was not just in your head or the imagination, but that, it, well, in Jungian terms, those warrior images or spirits arose from the collective unconscious, not just your personal unconscious. From the traditional spiritually oriented cultures would say, of course, the warriors of old, their spirits returned to you for your birthday, mm -hmm. to recognize your transformation, to support us in yesterday in our Agent Orange seminar, and today on this seminar, and to allow and support you in recognizing the spiritual warrior in you and that you are indeed walking with and honored by the warriors of the ages. <laughs> we think we're so alone, but we're so not alone if we can get through to the other side. So true. So true. Um. Ed, I can't believe we're at the end of the show. <laughs> I wish we could continue oh, to go on. <laughs> we're just getting started here, and uh, I, I uh, wow, what a what a incredibly powerful show today. Uh, before we we close out, do you have a couple more minutes? We'll we'll go over just about five minutes uh, here. For uh, I do, and I have a closing prayer. Okay. Um, just want to make uh, you know thank KUHS uh, again uh, for for spon for for being the platform the sponsor here down for uh, the council and having allowed uh, us to broadcast here and uh, thank you Henry and everybody here all the great 
the DJs and, and personalities and the people that are here, some wonderful people sharing their, their, their gifts, their music, their talents, uh, uh, broadcasting here not only in Denver but all across the nation and all around the world. Uh, KUHSDenver.com and also uh, need to make sure that you know we uh, recognize uh, as well that this series is a very special series that the council has partnered up with with the Trauma Sensitive Awareness Foundation. Uh, this is part one. Uh, it is all 10, ten series uh, interview to bring information, hope, inspiration, and healing. We're exploring cutting edge treatments and alternative therapies. We're hearing pioneering veterans and mental injury experts. And we're finding hope for PTS and TBI, moral injury, sleep disturbance, family conflict, emotional trauma, and so much more. Part two debuts in November at www.t-saf.org. Again, that's t-saf.org. Um, and um, could you share with us just uh, before, um, you know, how do we know when the spiritual warrior inside of us has arrived? I'll quote another veteran who's been through this process. The light was, the light inside was out, and it turned back on. <laughs> That's true. It's perfect. It, perfect, yeah. perfect, mm -hmm. perfect. So when the light turns on inside, when you can feel again, oh my gosh. when you're not afraid of feeling again, yeah. when you can laugh and cry, when you can allow yourself to grieve that which you, we grieve, when you're not, when you're not ashamed of your life and hiding your story, but you come out and you share it with dignity and honor, and know that it belongs to all of us. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't want to kill yourself because you want to kill the pain, but you want to live even with pain. Yeah. All of these are signs that the soul is back, the spirit is back. Amen to that. Amen. Uh, Ed, could you close us out uh, with the Last poem before we sign off for today. Yes, thank you. Honored to, and um, well, people know from your last name that you are of Italian heritage, so I purposely, again for your birthday, <laughs> went to our Italian warrior heritage. Uh, and this has been, a, we don't know that it's, it's an important lesson in the warrior tradition. Uh, ancient Rome, as we know, was a very warrior, warlike society, and they worshiped Mars, the god of war, as their second most important after Jove, uh, Jupiter, the, the king god. So they were warlike and they did worship it, but they also knew how destructive and painful it was. In the center of Rome, there was the temple of Janus. That's, people have seen the picture, the two-faced guy. He's got one face looking in each direction. That's like a, a yin-yang symbol, war and peace, dark and light, good and evil. Okay, so the Temple of Janus. The gates of the Temple of Janus were always left open when Rome was at war. So for hundreds of years, the temple gates were open, and they were hoping that God was helping their cause. Well, they closed the gates when they were at peace. And there was the Pax Romana that lasted 200 years. And the people celebrated greatly outside that temple and throughout the empire that we weren't at war now. This is the, uh, my translation and adaptation of the prayer that was uh, inscribed, carved into uh, the temple over the gates of the temple of Janus. Open in wartime, close in peacetime. This is the prayer. And bless you, happy birthday to you, my brother. <laughs> Thank you, my brother. The prayer on the temple of James. 
for all of us. May the gates of the temple of the two-faced God close and remain closed. May counsel and speech, the tools of the guardians of peace, may counsel and speech, the tools of the guardian of, of peace, forever hold dominion over the weapons of strife. Amen. 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 Amen to that. Oh, Doc, thank you so much. Thank you, You're thank welcome. you, thank you. Uh, what an, an extraordinarily special uh, show this has been. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in uh, here on this uh, really special day. Um, folks, we will be back next week. The council is adjourned. May you all be well. May you all be free of pain and suffering. May you all be whole. God bless. We'll see you next week. God bless.